the rule of law has not come down as manna from heaven. As a matter of fact, it has involved centuries of struggle, first between an absolute monarch and elected members of parliament, and in its second phase, between the elected members of parliament and the other so-called branches of government. But to begin at the beginning, we must go back in Anglo-Saxon jurisprudence to the year 1066. 1066 happens to be the year in which two cataclysmic events took place. One was Halley's Comet passed over England and most of the world, which it does every 76 years, heralding perhaps a new era. And the second was the victory of William of Normandy over King Harold in England, thereby ushering in a new dynasty of Norman rulers. Originally, they had Anglo-Saxon rulers. Now, Norman rulers came in. And with Norman rulers came a more brutal and ineffective series of laws together with a monarch who was more or less absolutist in the manner in which he executed them. William the Conqueror came and died, and his son, William Rufus, William II, happened to be much more ruthless than him. Fortunately for England, he also died in a hunting accident in 1100. That led to the youngest son, that is Henry I, taking over. Now, Henry I's coronation charter is perhaps the first important document that we have in English constitutional law, which established the rule of law. The coronation charter was a charter by which the nobles bargained with Henry I and made him lay down the fact that excessive taxes would not be collected, that justice would be tempered with mercy generally, and that most importantly, in the 14 clauses of that chat chapter, of that charter, clause number 13, which said that we will go back to the laws and the manner of their execution of the saintly Edward the Confessor, who was there prior to Norman rule. So Henry I's coronation charter, therefore, laid down what in modern terms could be called very fundamental rudiments of the rule of law. What followed from this charter was various other monarchs who came in until we come to perhaps one of the most despised monarchs in English history, the Plantagenet King, John. Now, John had a running battle with his nobles, as a result of which he was ultimately forced at Runnymede, which is a place midway between London and Windsor to actually sign what was called the Magna Carta. Now, why it is called the Magna Carta is to distinguish it from a forest charter of the same time. The forest charter granted all persons, unlike the Magna Carta, which granted only free men, which was 10 or 20 percent of the population of the time. The forest charter granted rights in the royal forests to the common man rights such as the collection of wood, the collection of forest produce, etc. The Magna Carta was signed, however, between the barons or the lords and King John. And what the barons were able to wrest from him was contained in 63 clauses. We are concerned today with the famous clauses 39 and 40, which lay down the rudiments of the rule of law as we know it today. Clause 39 stated specifically that no free man shall be arrested or detained otherwise than in the courts of law and by trial by his peers or by the law of the land. And clause 40 said to no free man shall we sell, delay or deny justice. Clause 61, which was since dropped, was an interesting clause because that was a clause which showed you the distrust the barons had of this terrible monarch. 
clause 61 said that if for some reason king john were not in fact to enforce the charter then 25 barons would be at liberty to go against the king's property but not against the king's person magna carta was signed in june 1215 very shortly after and interestingly it was a document in latin not in norman french the idea perhaps being that the pope should ultimately sanction it far from sanctioning it pope innocent the third was one of the extremely strong medieval popes annulled it in august of that year king john died of dysentery soon after in 1216 and his young son henry the third at age nine had to take over the realm fortunately for the rule of law henry the third decided in favor of magna carta so that in 1225, you had printed copies of it circulating around. This went on into the reign of his son, Edward I. And in 1297, you actually had Magna Carta put, and that is clause 39 and 40 put, into a statute of parliament where it still remains. So today, we have the ancient 39 and 40 now embodied as clause 29 of the 1279 or 1297 statute which continues to obtain in england moving a little forward from this we come to edward the first grandson edward the third was another extremely powerful monarch not only did he also reprint magna carta but he made some small changes as well and one of the interesting changes that he made was that in clause 39, instead of trial by your peers, what was substituted was due process of law. A very interesting phrase that has crept into the US Constitution, but did not ultimately find its way in our Constitution. So from 1354 onwards, we find that Magna Carta of 1215 embodied the rule of law contained in England against absolutist monarchs, giving parliament certain rights so that parliament could speak on behalf of the persons who elected the members of parliament. We now come to another absolutist monarch, Charles I, who was the second Stuart king. You will remember that England was ruled by many dynasties, none of whom were English. So you first had the Norman French, and after the Battle of Bosworth Field in 1485, you had the Tudors. And after the Tudors, you had the Stuarts. The Tudors were Welsh, the Stuarts were Scot. And of course, finally, the House of Hanover, which continues today, which is German. And all this took place for the reason that you had to have protested monarchs ruling England after the disastrous reign of Queen Mary I, who tried to bring back Roman Catholicism. So you would much rather dig up somewhere for some Protestant king, though he didn't know English, George I, for example, and bring him to the throne, then put a Stuart monarch on the throne if he happened to be Catholic. But coming back to Magna Carta and coming back to the rule of law, we find that the next important English document is 1628, the Petition of Right. Now, this petition of right was against Charles I, who was another absolutist monarch. And the idea was that forced loans could not be taken from the people by the king. And arbitrary imprisonment made if forced loans were not given. Parliament therefore asserted its right in no uncertain terms, quoting from Magna Carta yet again. Charles I, of course, paid for his sins with his head. And he was executed on a sinister day, 30th January, 1649. Now, 30th January conjures up two other very sinister events. One is the accession of Hitler as Chancellor of Germany in 1933 on the same day. And one is the assassination of our beloved father of the nation on 30th January in 1948. Moving on to Charles II now, who was the son of Charles I, we find 
that he was the monarch who married Catherine of Briganza and has a direct connection with Bombay, where this school is set up. Because in 1662, Catherine of Briganza brought with her, apart from various other things, the islands of Bombay as dowry, which was then handed over to Charles I, who in turn handed it over for 10 pounds to the East India Company. But during Charles II's reign, in 1679, we had a very important measure passed by Parliament, which was the Habeas Corpus Act. And this ensured that the writ of habeas corpus would in fact be given by the king's bench all over the all, all, all over the realm in order to enforce the rights of Magna Carta. Interestingly, this act ought never have to have been passed. It got through the Lords 57 to 55 only because Lord Grey, first as a joke, but then thereafter seeing that the joke would have ramifications counted one extremely fat lord as 10 lords and therefore got to the figure of 57. Otherwise, it was in fact not passed by 55 to whatever else it was. I was never very strong in mathematics. So, by an accident of history, we have this famous Habeas Corpus Act of 1679, yet another important document in the evolution of the rule of law in English constitutional law. And finally, of course, with the expulsion of James II, who was the Catholic, uh, Catholic monarch who suddenly gave birth to a, to a male heir and who was expelled in the glorious revolution of 1688. Glorious, why? Because not a uh, shot was fired. James slunk off to France and William, that is his son-in-law, took over as William III together with his Protestant daughter, Mary II. Now, 1689 marks another watershed because this Bill of Rights, so to speak, was passed by Parliament, where various constitutional guarantees as we know them today in our fundamental rights chapter were granted, including things such as no excessive fines or bails and no cruel and unusual punishment. From this, we move a hundred years forward to the first great constitutional document known perhaps to mankind, that is the US Constitution of 1789. Now, this constitution makes landmark strides in the rule of law for this reason, that for the first time, you have a practical application of the Montesquieu doctrine of separation of powers. You have power now diffused between various branches of government. So that in the place of one absolutist monarch or an equally absolutist parliament, if you may put it that way, you have power now distributed among Congress, who is to make laws, among the executive, who is to execute these laws, and among the judiciary, in which cases between states and states states or states and individuals are to be fought out and ultimately their decrees to be enforced by the executive. The original US Constitution didn't contain a Bill of Rights. That came only by amendment. And the first 11 amendments incorporated important freedoms, which we take almost for granted today. The very first amendment incorporated the right to free speech and press. The Fourth Amendment was equally important in that searches and seizures which were illegal and without warrant were interdicted. Were interdicted. The Fifth Extremely Important Amendment dealt specifically with life, liberty and property not being taken away except by due process of law, which phrase, as I have told you a little earlier, was found in the statute of Edward III in 1354. And the Eighth Amendment equally bodily lifted from the 1689 Bill of Rights, the interdict against cruel and unusual punishments. Now, all this ultimately led to our own constitution, which was promulgated in 1950, after shaking off the colonial era to which we were subject. 
the preamble to our constitution is like a mini constitution because it gives you the values and principles of our constitution and the rule of law therefore that is contained therein the preamble begins with the words that we the people of india are now going to give to ourselves a constitution in which india is a sovereign democratic republic each word is pregnant with meaning india is now sovereign in the sense that it governs itself it is no longer a colony of another superpower situated abroad it is democratic in the sense that you have universal adult suffrage by which governments are then elected in order to govern the people and this is done by means of free and fair elections which is then handed over by part 15 so to speak of the constitution to an independent election commission of india the safeguard given is that the chief election commissioner who may be flanked by other election commissioners as well has a fixed tenure and cannot be removed save and except by impeachment which is a difficult almost impossible procedure so sovereign and democratic show us that we now govern ourselves through the ballot and that the ballot must be free and fair in terms of the elections held the fact that we are a republic again shows us that we are not a monarchy indeed we have shaken off autocratic monarchical rule but we are now a republic meaning that we are republican in the american sense of um, the montesquieu doctrine of the separation of powers and the diffusion of powers so as not to waste too much power in any one constitutional authority interestingly the two words added by the 42nd amendment namely socialist and secular were proposed by professor kt shah in the constituent assembly dr ambedkar said no it was a necessary to have either socialist or secular because socialism was a creed which you could find in any case from the in the directive principles of state policy and secular of course our constitution was so he found it unnecessary at the time however now that we have these two words they are both pregnant with meaning socialist in its broad sense denotes a government for the people by the people so in the broad sense you are governing for the people as a whole who you will of course treat with equal respect you also have apart from this the concept now of secularism now you are a secular state in two senses one the state itself has no religion and second the state does not in any manner look upon one religion with favor and another with disfavor in short all religions are to be treated alike this is a very very important concept in today's milieu and a little more will be said about it a little later then of course you have the great justice clause that there must be justice social economic and political political justice was delivered almost at one stroke by having universal adult suffrage economic justice is how the teeming millions who are so poor in this country are to be pulled up by their bootstraps and of course social justice is the justice of those who traditionally have been downtrodden such as our harijans all of which are contained in various provisions and articles in our constitution most importantly after justice we have the concept of liberty now liberty is extremely important because not only is liberty of thought and expression but it is also liberty of belief faith and worship adding strength to the word secular so that what distinguishes this democracy from other so called democracies 
is the fact that you have freedom of speech and expression and that everybody is entitled to profess whichever faith in terms of in religious terms he chooses apart from this you also then have equality of status and opportunity equality of status being the age old concept the magna carta concept of everybody being equal before the law as a matter of fact bracton very early in the 1200s had said as a matter of legal commentary that the king himself is under both god and the law because the law itself made him king so it is the, in this sense that everybody is equal before the law which is fleshed out in our fundamental rights chapter and finally you have the cardinal and extremely important principle of fraternity now fraternity denotes something positive there is a positive ring to it that is all men are brothers all persons whatever caste creed etc are brothers and sisters and this will ensure this alone will ensure the unity and integrity of the nation so having done with the preamble we find that the rule of law embodied in it is very clear the rule of law is much more than just clauses 39 and 40 of magna carta the rule of law or the rule of the constitution in this country would therefore require power to be diffused among the great branches of government and the individual citizen given certain freedoms which inhere in him and for this we go straight away to the fundamental rights chapter or chapter 3 of the constitution of india it begins with the definition of state in article 12 but article 13 is the key to this chapter because article 13 fleshes out in no uncertain terms the doctrine of judicial review now judicial review in the united states has to be established by case law there was no article 13 as a matter of fact in the seminal decision of marbury versus madison you find that william marbury was a justice of the peace who has been given a commission by the adams administration which commission had not physically been delivered to him so that he could not therefore take oath and sit as a justice of the peace he therefore petitioned the supreme court directly and said look there is the judiciary act of 1789 the 13th section of which specifically states that you the supreme court can give me the writ of mandamus that i am asking for namely i am asking for a writ commanding the authorities to hand over my commission now chief justice marshall was the person who as secretary of state of the adams administration had actually signed that commission so it was improper for him to have taken up the case in the first instance but it is obvious that he took it up for the purpose of establishing what according to him very early in his chief justice ship he was chief justice for 34 long years the doctrine of judicial review so he did this by doing one other amazing thing he could also have construed the 13th section of the judiciary act as it stood stating that the writ of mandamus would apply only in the appellate and not original jurisdiction of the supreme court because it followed upon a clause conferring appellate jurisdiction he did no such thing he was very anxious to lay this down as a doctrine so what did he do he pitted section 13 against article 3 of the constitution which is the supreme law under article 6 said that the two don't square because article 3 clearly made it known that the only original jurisdiction of the supreme court would be in cases involving states ambassadors and the like in short not between states and individuals like william marbury and therefore what he did was to strike down the 13th section saying it is un- unconstitutional because it violates article 3 of the constitution of india now all this laid down what is known in our constitutional law as judicial review having all this before them the founding fathers thought it important 
to lay down in an article of the constitution explicitly that all laws that are made by legislatures and or by the executive must conform to the fundamental rights chapter of the constitution otherwise they are to be declared void so with this voidness comes a very very important concept of the rule of law that it is the judiciary who sits as the ultimate arbiter even of laws made by the legislature and if that those laws do not conform to the constitution then they will be struck down as being invalid now often we are told and we have been reminded quite often even in the recent past that look you judges are not elected representatives you are appointed how then can you take it into your can so to speak to annul laws made by a legislature which consists of elected representatives fortunately for us the answer to that question is in the constitution itself and we don't need to labor it but these heads keep rearing themselves from time to time and have to be scotched by the courts clearly stating that look in our constitutional law it is the higher judiciary consisting of the supreme court and the high courts who ultimately are the arbiters who decide and who decide that laws if they are unconstitutional must go as a matter of fact we have gone much further than just this and we have laid down in the seminal decision of kesavananda bharti of 13 honorable judges the fact that the constitution itself if it is amended contrary to what we call its basic structure or the principles contained in the provisions as fleshed out from the preamble the constitutional amendment itself would be liable to be struck down now the justification for all this comes really from a very interesting paper number 78 of the federalist papers the federalist papers incidentally were written by three great americans one justice john j who happened to be their first chief justice he wrote five of them two by the father of their constitution james madison who was the fourth president of the united states and the bulk of them by alexander hamilton who was the first secretary of the treasury in the washington administration now hamilton's paper number 78 deals specifically with the judicial and 78 tells us that whereas the legislature has the purse and the executive the sword the judiciary by its very nature is the weakest branch of government and the least likely to upset the political rights of the purse of the people for the reason that it hath neither force nor will but only judgment and even for judgment ultimately it has to depend upon the executive arm to ultimately enforce those judgments so the rationale given by alexander hamilton for the us constitution holds good today as well unelected judges are the best arbiters between the citizen and the state and the and one state against another state for the reason that ultimately they go by judgment not by force or by will and are therefore the least harmful of the three so called institutions of government coming back to the fundamental rights chapter we now find that article 14 tells us that all persons are equal before the law something that magna carta told us long long back and also adds that the laws will equally protect you you have the equal protection of the laws as well now what is the the meaning of the equal protection of the laws this comes out well in an early american case yickwo versus hopkins it's a judgment of justice matthew speaking for a unanimous Supre us supreme court in 1886 and the case involved chinese laundrymen now chinese laundrymen were aliens in the sense that they were not us citizens so the first question that arose was whether they had any rights at all 
and whether the 14th Amendment would apply to them. The answer given was, you don't have to be a citizen so long as you are a person. And they are persons, therefore, the 14th Amendment or the Equality Clause there would apply to them. Second, the law laid down that so far as San Francisco was concerned, all laundrymen had to take out licenses. And those licenses could only be given to structures in which those laundries were contained, provided they were made of brick. If they were made of wood, then no license could be granted. The Chinese laundryman came forward with a case stating that every single Chinese laundryman happened to have his laundry in wooden structures. And there were some 300 odd, as opposed to 80 odd by other um, com competing Americans. The court ultimately said that the equal protection of the laws means really the protection of equal laws. And if the law is administered in an unequal fashion, then the law itself would be struck down. This is a very important doctrine so far as the rule of law was concerned. So the protection of equal laws therefore means that when you actually make the law neutral on its face, but de facto really hitting out at one group, then you will look at the de facto and not the de jure position and say that the protection of equal laws has been denied. We now move on to the other great articles of the fundamental rights chapter. You have Article 17, which abolishes untouchability. I told you that that was a promise that was made in the very beginning. And that is how you achieve social justice, which is, which is set out in our great preamble. So 17 is not only, out, uh, out, not only outlaws untouchability, but makes it an offense, which is punishable by law. 18 equally states that nobody can receive titles. And it's important here in the context of all persons, therefore, being equal before the law. We now come to the seven freedoms contained in 19. And 19 is a very, very important article. 19 contains the difference between democracies like ours and dictatorships that are veiled as democracies. 19.1a contains the single most important and cherished human right, which is the right to freedom of speech and expression. Now, unfortunately, of late, we have had in this country young persons, students, stand-up comedians and the like, all being booked for freely criticizing the government of the day under sedition laws, which are really colonial in nature and have no place under our constitution. On the other hand, you have persons giving hate speech, what is called fighting words in Chaplinsky versus New Hampshire, or hate speech, actually calling for the genocide of an entire people. And we find the great reluctance reluctant some of the authorities to book these people. It was heartening to note, at least, that uh, a little later, the vice president of the country in a speech said that hate speech is unconstitutional. Not only is it unconstitutional, it happens to be a criminal act. It is criminalized in 153 capital A and 505C of the Indian Penal Code. Unfortunately, in practice, though a person can be given up to three years imprisonment. This never really happens because there are no minimum sentences prescribed. If we really want to strengthen the rule of law as contained in our constitution, I would suggest strongly that parliament amend these provisions to provide minimum sentences so that they act as deterrents for others who make hate speech of this kind. We also have, unfortunately, the other higher echelons of the ruling party, not only being silent qua hate speech, but almost endorsing it. We heard the other day from the very head of the party, a juxtaposition of a Mughal emperor known for being a bigot, namely Aurangzeb, 
as against Shivaji was known to be a secular leader. Now, if as a matter of fact, fraternity is a cardinal value in our constitution and you want to engage persons in becoming a brotherhood, I would have thought that you should have chosen Mughal emperors such as Babur or his grandson Akbar. Akbar was famous for being perhaps one of the most secular rulers that any nation has ever known in any point of time. And he took after his grandfather Baba. Interestingly, at this point, I want you to read, or I'll read out to you a letter written by Baba to his son Humayun. One year before he died on 11 January 1529, telling his son as to how to rule Hindustan, which he had conquered, so to speak, after the Battle of Panipat. He says, Oh, my son, the realm of Hindustan is full of diverse creeds. Praise be to God, the righteous, the glorious, the highest, that he had granted thee and unto thee the empire. It is but proper that you, with heart cleansed of all religious bigotry, should dispense justice according to the tenets of each community. And in particular, refrain from the sacrifice of the cow. For that way lies the conquest of the hearts of the people of Hindustan. And the subjects of the realm will, through royal favor, be devoted to thee. The temples and abodes of worship of every community under imperial sway, you should not damage. Dispense justice so that the sovereign may be happy with the subjects and likewise the subjects with their sovereign. The progress of Islam is better by the sword of kindness, not by the sword of oppression. Ignore the disputations of Shias and Sunnis, for therein is the weakness of Islam. And bring together the subjects with different beliefs in the manner of the four elements, so that the body politic may be immune from various ailments. And remember the deeds of Hazrat Taimud Sayyid, so that you may become mature in matters of government. And, our, and he ends by saying, and on us is but the duty to advise. A beautiful letter. His grandson carried all this into practice. His grandson, in fact, had the famous Ibadat Karma built in 1575, where persons from all the religions of the world, including the Charvak school, which is the ancient Hindu materialist school, were present and who debated freely before the emperor. The emperor, in fact, greatly not only acknowledged but furthered the cause of every religious faith. So much so that many religious faiths said that they had exclusively somehow or the other got to the emperor and converted him. The emperor finally, of course, came out with his Dine Ilai, which failed because it was too eclectic. It had no priesthood, etc. But the idea was fantastic. The idea was try and bring together mankind as a common whole, which custom has divided. So when you have 191A being administered, as it is being administered today, there is a big red signal that is put up so far as the rule of law is concerned. It is time to do away completely with these sedition laws and allow free speech so long as ultimately it does not exhort somebody to violence and end up as being hate speech. Apart from 19, you also have the great freedoms in 20 and 21, which harken back to Magna Carta. That is, that no person shall, and no, no person shall in any manner find his life or liberty curtailed or denied, except by due procedure established by law. In Article 22, you have the two great safeguards of having a lawyer of your choice the moment you are arrested and being produced before a magistrate within 24 hours of your arrest. Now, these various freedoms, including the great freedoms that you now find in Article 25, where every person has the right to freely profess every religious faith that he or she chooses. And the cultural rights of the citizens of India, which are 
all contained in Article 29, which perhaps is an article which exists only in our constitution. I have not found it in any other. It says every section of the people have the right, and it's an absolute right. It is not subjected to any reasonable restrictions. So this absolute right is now given to persons to preserve their culture in its widest sense. Most important of all is Article 32, which again is a unique feature of our constitution alone. Article 32 makes it clear that it is a fundamental right of every citizen of this country to move the Supreme Court so that their fundamental rights be enforced. It's a remarkable article. You can either do this or go to the High Courts under Article 226. And the judiciary, therefore, is set up as being the person or the institution which ultimately gives a person the right to his fundamental rights. The judiciary itself is set up as an independent body under Article 124, where the government of the day has to consult the Chief Justice, which in practice means the judges appointing themselves today, so that government interference is removed. And it's with this independent judiciary, ultimately, therefore, that the rule of law is ultimately maintained. Another very important article is Article 144. 144 says all authorities, civil and judicial, shall act in aid of the Supreme Court. Now, this is something that is explicitly laid down given the history, both of the United States and of India. So far as our history is concerned, we actually had a judge called John Peter Grant, an English judge, who in 1829, because Governor Malcolm refused thrice to execute a writ, actually locked his court up and set sail for England. He did so because of the ultimate weakness of the judiciary, as was pointed out in Hamilton's paper 78, because ultimately you have to rely upon the executive to actually enforce your orders. Now, not only did he set sail, but he came back, but this time as a chastened person, because the authorities somehow stayed with Governor Malcolm and sent him back with two other judges, so that in their words, a wild elephant would sit between two tame ones. The wild elephant ultimately landed up in Calcutta to great public acclaim and was loved by the Indian people. Equally, at around the same time, Chief Justice Marshall went out of his way to decide a particular case in favor of a cleric called Wooster, called Chisholm versus, uh, not Chisholm, versus, but Wooster versus Georgia. And the state of Georgia apparently had entered into a treaty with the Cherokee Indians, which it did not somehow or the other honor. Wooster was required to take out a license under Georgia's laws and went to the Georgia Supreme Court. Supreme Court said, yes, you must take out that, that license. The US Supreme Court reversed Chief Justice Marshall saying that as and when you happen to be on Cherokee land, it is Cherokee Indian law that applies and not Georgia law. Andrew Jackson, who was the president at the time, cocked a snoop at the Supreme Court and said, Marshall has laid down his judgment, let him enforce it. Today, such things are almost unthinkable. Why do I say almost? Because we've also had the Sabrimala case, which all of you must be familiar with. Despite five learned judges of the Supreme Court having laid down that women between the ages of 10 and 50 can enter, no woman was allowed to enter. And most unfortunately, the Supreme Court itself sent this judgment by way of a review petition, something unheard of, to a bench of nine judges to be decided along with other matters. And thereby, Sabrimala has now gone into limbo. So we find that whatever we take for granted in terms of constitutional rule of law cannot ever be taken for granted. It is very important to remember that eternal vigilance is necessary 
not only for liberty, but for liberty enforced by courts, which is the rule of law of this country. I end on this note and I thank you all very much. I wish the DM Harish School of Law all the very best in the future. Thank you all.